Let's pray. Lord God, we come to you in anticipation. We thank you, Lord, that you have come to us and revealed your character and your nature, that you alone are God. And yet we, we know you through the Father, through the Son, and through the Holy Spirit. We pray this morning that you would open us up to this joyous truth of who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Today is Trinity Sunday. It's celebrated as the first Sunday after Pentecost. It's one of the few feasts of the church year that's celebrated as a doctrine rather than as an event. It's a time to celebrate and remember that God exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it's time to remember and celebrate that God is more wonderful, God is greater, He's more complex than anything we find in creation. There is nothing or no one like God. Yet all of creation shows forth His majesty, His power, His glory. Psalm 50 that we read antiphonally this morning invites us to lift up voices and the musical instruments and finding ways to worship the Lord in power, to experience God through worship, to be creative. Because we're worshiping the God who is worthy of it, a God who all creation reveals him. As a matter of fact, at the very end of Psalm 150, it invites everything that has breath to praise the Lord. The doctrine of the Trinity has the same invitation. We should marvel and celebrate our God who is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For he stands alone above all creation as the object of our praise, of our adoration. This doctrine is a foundational teaching in Christianity. And it's come under severe criticism since the early church was formed. Early church father Tertullian, who lived from 160 to 220, you probably didn't know him. He was the first to form the doctrine of the Trinity with the language of persons and essence. He wrote that God exists in three distinct persons, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but each has his own essence. And the basic idea is that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are co-equal, they're co-eternal, and yet each are self-aware. The three persons are eternally together and cooperating. Each person is involved in everything that the others do. Jesus said in John 10, 38, understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. And the Spirit is both the, the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ. Listen to Romans 8, 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you, and anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. The fourth century was a very difficult time for historic Christianity as the teaching of the Trinity came under real attack. And those who rejected the divinity of Christ, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they sought to undermine this historic Christian doctrine. Each early church father, Gregory of Nicaea, Nicaea, I don't know, I didn't know him, but he lived 335 to 394. And he refuted the, those who were teaching that there was no Trinity. And he explained the unity of the Trinity in a very helpful way. He said, but in the case of divine nature, we do not similarly learn that the Father does anything by himself in which the Son does not work conjointly. Or again, that the Son has any special operation apart from the Holy Spirit. But every operation which extends from God to creation has its origin from the Father and proceeds through the Son and is perfected by the Holy Spirit. So we can see here that the Scripture emphasizes general distinctions among the works or functions of the three persons. God the Father is the initiator. 
The Son is the one who complies to the will of the Father. And the Holy Spirit executes the divine will coming from all three. We should always give equal attention and equal honor to all three persons of the Trinity while remembering that we worship only one God in these three persons. Each week when we recite the Nicene Creed, we are affirming that we believe in the, in the true triune God who allows us to experience us, to experience him in the members of the Trinity. The word Trinity is not used anywhere in the Bible, but doesn't take long before we can clearly see that it is taught in the Old and New Testaments. In this morning's gospel from Matthew 28, we read how Jesus himself assumed the doctrine of the Trinity when he commanded that baptism was to be done in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In our epistle reading from 2 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul ends the letter with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Last week on the day of Pentecost, I, I read to you John 14, 15 to 17. I want to read it to you again. Jesus, in talking to his disciples, said, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he dwells with you, and he will be in you. Jesus was leaving the disciples to go back to the Father. But he said, I'm going to send back another helper, just like him. It's the Holy Spirit. In this text, we see the Father and the Son sending back the Holy Spirit to indwell the believer. And in doing so, it will be as if Jesus himself was right there with them bodily. The Trinity together were acting to accomplish the divine will of which they're in complete agreement, always have been, and always will be. This morning, I want to briefly discuss the triune presence in the creation story of Genesis 1. It's an amazing story of the divine will being accomplished by the Trinity from the very beginning of the creation story. And thank you, Charlene, for, for reading such a long, so, so wonderfully read such a long passage of Scripture. From the very beginning of, of Genesis to the end of the book of Revelation, we find the Trinity very much involved in the working out of all that God does. Unlike the deist, who believes that God is impersonal. After he creates, he, he walks away and, and merely says, in essence, well, good luck, guys. I hope it works out for you. In the creation account of Genesis, we find a written record of the creative genius and perfection that is still observable today around the world. God has allowed scientists to discover, to discover ways where we can see the universe and all of its manifest glory, revealing the Creator, kind of showing off, really, the beauty of it. Don't you enjoy those pictures that are coming back? Unlike our first parents, we have the privilege of that. This should cause us to pause and marvel at the countless ways God has revealed himself in the grandeur and beauty of all of creation. Even those around the throne of God praise him as the creator and the sustainer of creation. Listen to Revelation 4, 9 to 11. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, O our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and are created from the very first book of the Bible to the very last book of the Bible we find the reason that God is worthy to be praised and honored and glorified is because he's the sovereign Lord and creator of all things 
If that is all we knew about him, that would be enough reason to bow down before him and praise and adoration and worship his holy name. But the good news is that's not all that we know about him. But he has shared us with us his word. And he has given us his Holy Spirit that never stops revealing him, him to us and through all that he's made. Our scripture reading this morning from Genesis chapter 1, the word of God begins our focus on the creation account as an event entirely accomplished by God alone, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the first thing we need to see is that it was God who created, and that he did so out of nothing. Therefore, before the heavens or the earth, including the vastness of the universe, nothing else existed but God. And this is where we can't understand, right? This is where you go, wow, but we should go wow in considering our God. In Psalm 33, the psalmist captures this beautifully. He says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath, the ruach, the spirit of his mouth, all their hosts. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. Amen. David Guzik, in his commentary on, on Genesis, writes this. The ancient Hebrew word bara created is specific. It means to create, a, create out of nothing, showing that God created the world out of nothing, not even from himself, for God is separate from his creation. Unlike Eastern and pantheistic perceptions of God, the God teaches, our God teaches that the universe could perish, and yet God would remain. Men cannot create in the same sense of the term used in Genesis 1.1. We can only fashion or form things out of existing material. The closest we come to creating is in reproducing ourselves through pro procreation, and even that is a gift from God. And the insistence by some that there is no God is to ignore all of the evidence and the perfection of creation. For the most part, for most of us, this is not breaking news. But there has never been a more important time for Christians to focus on the greatness and the power of God in order to increase our faith and our trust in Him. During these days of godlessness and apostasy, we should find great comfort in the fact that God is far greater than we can comprehend and is able to do far more than we could ever even imagine. So before we move on to Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, consider the claims of John's gospel concerning the role of the Son in creation. We'll read to you John 1, 1 to 3, and verse 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Then in verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. One of the first things we see is that John is, through the witness of the Holy Spirit, informs the reader that the, that the Word has eternally existed and was the agent that God used to create the heavens and the earth. And the Word's name was Jesus, the only Son of the Father. A few weeks ago, we looked at the high priestly prayer of John chapter 17. Listen to verses 5 and 24. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Now we compare the evidence for all the Trinity being involved together in creation in verse 2 of Genesis 1. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. 
When God began to transform the earth into something beautiful and compatible with his great plan, he started with the work of the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit begins every work of creation, every work of recreation. Remember in the Nicene Creed that we read every week, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. And with the Father and Son, he's worshiped and glorified. God created the universe through the Word, the work and the, and the, work of, and the Word of the Son. And then the Spirit breathes life into creation. Again, the word used for spirit is ruach, which means breath or wind. Last week on Pentecost, I pointed out one of my favorite examples of the use of that word ruach was in Ezekiel chapter 37, the valley of dry bones. The Lord commands Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones, and when he does, sinew and muscle and flesh begin to appear, but there's no life in the now fully formed bodies. And it wasn't until the Lord breathed Ruach upon the bodies that they came to life because the Ruach, the Spirit of God, always brings life. The Lord tells Ezekiel that when the Spirit of God brought back life to the dry bones, they would know that he was God. Throughout the Old and New Testaments are examples of, of the breath of the wind of God being associated with creating power, the power of God. It's important to remember that the Spirit of God was there at creation because he was there before creation. Charles Spurgeon wrote on this, the first divine act in fitting up this planet for the habitation of man was for the Spirit of God to move upon the face of the waters. Until that time, all was formless, empty, out of order, and in confusion. In a word, it was chaos. And to make it into that living thing of beauty which the world is at the present moment, even though it's a fallen world, it was needful that the movement of the Spirit of God should take place upon it. This has not changed one bit. If we want revival, then we must cry out to God to breathe, to pour out His Spirit, the power of life, the power of renewal. If that doesn't happen, we're just going to have the walking dead. In Genesis 1, 3 to 25. We read of God speaking into existence, existence all the power of His divine will as, as manifested and seen there. There was no struggle with opposing forces. And all things came together according to the creative will of God. It's not my intention today to look at all the, all the acts of creation, but to focus on the presence of the Trinity in creation. However, I will mention one thing, that every part of the creation, God moved in such a way that he satisfied his purpose and to prepare for humanity's role in that creation, in his created world. In every creative event, God showed his power and authority by overcoming the chaos and the darkness and bringing everything into perfect order and under his dominion. By his words, he brought into existence all things and, and he even declared their meaning and their purpose. He created with a level of perfection that allowed creation to be able to sustain, sustain itself. There's nothing and no one in the universe like God. And that's the primary reason that the writer of Proverbs could say, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I never cease to be amazed at the level of arrogance and blindness of those who suggest that God isn't just and good because he does not measure up to their, their expectations of what God ought to be. So let's now read the final verses revealing the presence of, of the triune God in creation. Genesis 1, 26, 27. And then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. 
and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. That's important in today's world to know that, isn't it? For me, one of the most mysterious acts of God in creation is creating man in his image and likeness. It certainly doesn't mean that we look like God. He has two arms and two legs and nose, ears, and a body like a human being. Remember Jesus told the, the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4, 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him worship him in spirit and in truth. And some have suggested that bearing God's image speaks to our being personal, rational, creative, and moral creatures. And certainly the Apostle Paul's letters stress that being changed into the image of God is closely associated with becoming like Christ, like Ephesians 4.24, or in Colossians 3, 9 to 10, that we put off the old, take off the old self and put on the new self in Christ. Paul writes, you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Both of these are important, but the question remains, what was Moses referring to in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 27, as he sought to encourage the children of Israel to be faithful to the God of their fathers? Dr. Richard Pratt writes, in the ancient historical context, to be an image of God was associated with the idea of being a royal son of God. Ancient kings were thought to be the sons of the gods, imbued with honor of ensuring that the will of heaven be enforced on earth. This concept was part of God's design for the kings of Israel, who were called sons of God. In Genesis, however, a radical extension of this outlook of the Son or the image of God is applied to every human being, male and, and female, He created them. The point is that in the biblical view, all human beings assume the honor and the value only attributed to royalty. All people were placed in the world to display the glory and the honor of the true and living God, the great king, the great creator of the universe. This will be done as human beings fulfill God's will on earth, subduing the earth and having dominion of it, over it, which is called the cultural mandate. In other words, we were designed for dignity as the sons and daughters of the king. Living any other way is living in squalor, is living as if the king did not exist, and not knowing who we are in Christ. Does it mean if we're a king, we're going to have a castle? Not yet. It means we follow him wherever he leads us, because of who he is, and because in him we now know who we are. The most amazing part of the stories of God acting to redeem his fallen creatures is that even though mankind has systematically disobeyed and turned away from their creator and his desire for them to come into the family of God, he still pursues us with the offer of the gospel. Do remember that even at Jesus' baptism, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were there to assist the Son in accomplishing the will of the Father, to provide a way for the marred and the broken image of God to be restored. Why? So that we might rejoice and join all of creation, praising God and enjoying Him in His presence. Anything other than that it's a lie. The universe is declaring the glory of God, and the reason we exist is to see the beauty and the glory of God who created it. To be overwhelmed by the amazing creation that God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit made for our benefit, for our provision. This should be the source of our joy and our fulfillment. Anything else is a diversion. Anything else is coming from the enemy and therefore is a lie. 
The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 1, 20 and 21, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, had been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that had been made. So they are without excuse, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. This is what's happened to our country and all around the world. The good news is, when God's image returns to the reason for their existence, to glorify God, to honor Him, to praise Him, to worship Him, and to make Him known, then God will release His Spirit and restore what has been destroyed. We can't do this on our own, nor can we legislate this to the ones who have rejected the one true and living God. In other words, we can't ask our government to do it for us. We must, as the people of God, bow down before the Lord in praise and just admiring Him and rejoicing with all He's done because we're created to do that. That's where joy comes from. The Scriptures teach us throughout that the Trinity is able to move in power through the created vessels that submit in love to their Creator. It's our only hope and the only true answer to the dilemma that confronts us. I want to close with reading Isaiah 45, verses 18 and 22 to 23. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, he is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back, that to me every knee will bow and every tongue will swear allegiance. This is God's promise. Do you want it? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have revealed so much about yourself, not just that you are the creator, God. We celebrate that and we worship you for that. But Lord, we have experiences individually as well as churches. We have experience of your presence. We have experience of how you have moved in power. And we've seen you do amazing things. We have seen your mercy. We have seen your grace. We have seen you do things that were not possible. And Lord, we love you. But I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will be poured out upon us. That we might walk into what you have created us to be. The sons and daughters of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.